Minette, thank you very much. That was a tremendous talk. Uh, however, I'm going to be very cheeky. Um, and uh, yeah, that's true. It's true. Isn't it? <laughs> um, I just can't resist, as a uh, conservative peer, um, talking to a union official. <laughs> Take, taking the side of the people against you <laughs> uh, uh, on this question of the Corn Laws and the privileged few. Because uh, although you, you uh, rightly say that you know, we need to be worried about uh, what's coming in from abroad, etc., um, if you go back to the Corn Laws debate, in the early 19th century, the people who in, you know, were defending the landowners who were doing well out of the Corn Laws, my ancestors, if you like, uh, they would often make arguments about the low quality of foreign produce. So we cannot have French uh, flour brought into this country. It's a, it's, it's all our children will die, etc. There is an element of exaggeration in this, is there not? And Jacob has a point, doesn't he? That footwear and clothing and food would, could be a lot cheaper for ordinary British people. Wouldn't matter much to the people in this room, but it would matter a lot to ordinary people. Look, it's, it's an extremely fair point, but I think the challenge is um, we don't want a bonfire of regulation. I mean, the Prime Minister has made it very clear that our standards are important to us and that we want to maintain them. And I think we all in this room believe in that. I don't want to see a bonfire of regulation. I want our standards maintained. But what I'm saying is that we should learn those lessons. You made the point about food prices. You know, when, again, many of you won't remember it, but in the 70s and the 80s, 25, 30% of our annual income was spent on food. 12% of our annual income now is what we spend on food. So we've responded, rightly or wrongly, to the efficiencies to become more competitive. Now, a lot of that is, is quite unpalatable, actually, when, when you look into it further. We've had long-term cheap food policy. Again, you can question whether that is right or not. But the point I am saying is that you can't have it all. You can't decide that we are going to take the moral high ground and, and shaft our conscience and our standards elsewhere. If we are going to do this seriously, and we want to be global leaders, and we want to be respected, then we've got to do it the whole hog. And so that's why I believe that, you know, you might say that what I'm saying is, is protectionist, and I think many people voted out of Europe because they wanted a more protectionist policy, and they didn't realize that actually it, it's going to be very different. But the point being, on those standards, whether you're producing pharmaceuticals or whatever you're producing, if we want to look after the landscape, as we are, you know, the best way we will do that is to maintain those standards. I don't disagree with that, and I think that it's an excellent uh, moment to ask for questions from the floor. So, uh, please, could you put your hands up, and I think a microphone will come towards you. Uh, I can see one right over there. And I was strictly enjoined not to take them in batches of three, so I'm not going to. <laughs> don't know why, but there we are. So, yeah, Nick Lamkin from the Organic Research Centre. I think agriculture enjoys the privilege of being one of the most biologically based industries, and yet we've heard very little today about the possibility of ecological innovation as a driver for what we do. The focus is on technology, technology, technology. Now, there's good points for technology. I'm not against it. I use it. But I think there are many opportunities that we're missing to drive things forward on an ecological basis. Um, Many other countries are driving forward much faster than the UK in that direction, especially in relation to agroecology and organic farming and agroforestry and issues like that. France, Germany, you name them, they're all ahead of us. Um, but we're not talking about that today. We don't seem to be, we seem to be missing that. I wonder what you think. Nick, look, it's, it's a really important point, and you know, we have, uh, and you've visited it many times, we have an organic forum um, within the union um, sharing best practice with our organic farmers. I think it's been enormously uh, valuable to conventional farmers. So, it, you know, it is, 
it's about everything that, that George Freeman and others have said, but it is also about, you know, getting back to farming. And one of the challenges we have had is that we do not have the rotations that we used to have through many um, challenges, not least um, disease. We do not have um, the, the mixed livestock that we used to have. So getting our inorganic fertilizer back into the system, um, you know, maybe hasn't happened as well as it could have done. I mean, I think that we both share the same ambition there. But, you know, for organic farming, you rightly want and deserve a premium, and, and that is how it should, it should remain. Any other questions? Uh, it's coming, Chris. Thank you very much. Yeah, Chris Tufnell, Chair, Royal Agricultural Society of England. Um, I think a lot of us are welcoming the uh, public money for public good dialogue and um, uh, Michael Gove is very enthusiastic in how he delivers a, a lot of um, how these public goods are going to be delivered. But the three billion number is still there and we're saying that's how it's going to be directed. Now some of the public goods that, that farmers are going to be paid for, they may already be delivering, which is, is fine. But some of the other environmental enhancements or environmental um, protection measures they're going to have to take are going to take up resources in terms of time and um, and money. What, what, what do you expect to happen to the productive side of their business that is no longer being supported by direct payments when a lot of their competitors will be shored up by direct pay payments? Well, that is why we don't feel all the money should go. And, uh, you know, where do you start with what is a public good? I mean, economists will tell you that food is not a public good. I hope I gave you a, a taste of the cost of regulation, the cost of welfare, all those things that we want to do. But they all cost money. And are those not public goods? I would say they are public goods, and we want to maintain them, we want to grow them. So I, I am slightly frustrated about this term, public goods. Food is a public right and a public necessity for each and every one of us. And what I said about availability of food to every income, I think is hugely important. If, if every taxpayer is going to be investing in this new policy, you know, they should all have access to it. We shouldn't just have a policy that is about just looking at, at the top tier, essentially the top 20% of consumers. So I think, you know, there has to be a, a discussion around, you know, the public goods delivery and where that goes. And that's why I put up the slide with the productivity and the volatility measures. I mean, most farmers would far rather farm without support, none of them want to, but the functionality of the supply chain and the fairness within the supply chain, you know, has, has to be addressed. You look at, at what is going on, and the farmers are doing the bulk of the work, taking the bulk of the risk, um, but ultimately you cannot, it's one industry that cannot pass those costs up the line. And the retailers at the moment, what I mentioned about the savage retail price war, you know, it is unique. You've got Aldi and Lidl putting 200 more stores up this year. Nobody is going. So that retail price war we will continue to live with. And they are under enormous pressure to keep food prices down. So I think it has to be about, you know, a threefold investment. That means we can deliver for the environment and we can deliver the investment on, on wider public goods. Can I come in on, on that conversation briefly? And uh, w w you, you showed quite rightly that the, the, the quantity of land that's been set aside for wildflowers or hedgerows or whatever by farmers, uh, some of that under agri-environment schemes, country stewardship schemes and so on, but some of it, including some on my own land where I've created a huge flower meadow and I'm very keen on it, uh, entirely voluntarily. The 25-year economic plan contains the idea of conservation covenants and the Law Commission being told to, to work out how to make these work, uh, whereby you could effectively do what Americans call an easement. You could, you could set land into something for conservation and it would uh, be in perpetuity protected as such. The trouble is it doesn't say anything about the incentives to an individual landowner to do that. And at the moment, we have a huge incentive that isn't cash to farmers to farm productively, which is called agricultural property relief uh, on in from inheritance tax. 
And should we not perhaps consider having something called conservation property relief, where you know landowners are encouraged to uh, do environmental projects uh, and reduce their exposure to inheritance tax or some other tax? I mean, uh, in other words, are there other ways of doing the ways of doing this that don't involve direct subsidy? Look, there's all sorts of fiscal opportunities out there. Um, the other thing that we have to factor in um, is that 55% of, of farmers are, are tenant farmers in, in one form or another. So you're seeing the end of Agricultural Holdings Act tenancies uh, and a lot of what we call farm business tenancies, which are shorter term and often only five to ten years. So it's got to be able to fit into that. I mean, I think the challenge with an agricultural policy is it is so complex. The food system is so complex. And we have to take the time. It's like what I said about trade. It's like doing the degree on top of the day job. We've got to take the time to understand the whole picture. And the point I just wanted to emphasise is it's not broken. Most of it is working really well and we do have a solid platform from which to build. But we must embrace change. This cannot be about wanting more of the same. It is about embracing change and the opportunities that are on offer. Does the bell indicate that we're finished, Alex? Two minutes, so time for another question. Straight at the back there. Thank you very much. Um, I saw your figure of about three million, and I'm an academic, so you put me out of business because I say to my students that now about 2% are employed directly in agriculture. Um, that three million presumably includes an awful lot of uh, occasional workers who come in and out. With uh, Brexit, what do the, your members want to happen in terms of the need for you know, seasonal labour? So, uh, that's a, uh, the future workforce is, is a massive challenge. I think we all thought many things. I mean, certainly the NFU never thought it would be lobbying on the future workforce. So, we have approximately 80,000 seasonal workers that, that come to the UK um, to pick, plant, pack, grade our fruit, flowers and vegetables. Um, since the Second World War, really, we've been having a, a SOARS scheme that ended in 2011 that was a global scheme. We were deemed to be exemplars in how we ran it. We knew who was coming here, how long they were here for, and when they went home again. What has happened with Brexit is that with the exchange rate uh, and with feeling slightly less welcome, they are not coming here to, to do those jobs. And there was already a shortfall anyway, but it... it September last year, it really came to a head, and 29% uh, was the shortfall on the survey. So the ask is for, for a global scheme. We do not see this as an immigration problem. It is people that come here are actually very well paid because it is highly regulated, and then they go home again. The challenge with seasonal workers, I've given a lot of evidence on it, is people will say, well, school children can do it. People in prisons can do it. You know, the role of a picker now, you know, you and I will be left, it, it, it is skilled work. Um, it is in very, very rural locations. So you take Herefordshire um, and, and counties like Kent, where the bulk of the fruit, vegetable and flower growing is happening. And you've got virtually zero unemployment and you've got very rural locations. So that's why it's evolved over generations. It doesn't even touch the side of the permanent workforce. And this is something that has to be politically addressed, along with hospitality and care, where often it's, it's 60 to, to 80 percent. And, you know, we, we just have to have a discussion. We have to build bridges in order to get to a more automated, mechanized world. We've got the capability robotically to pick a strawberry. Um, it's just investing in it and speeding that capability up. Uh, well, I think the second bell means... Th oh, no, there's, a, there's one more hand up. Can I...? And it's gender balance, so we can... We can. Thank goodness for gender balance, huh? <laughs> um, I'm concerned that health hasn't really been mentioned much. Um, you know, cheap food definitely does not equal healthy food. Um, we're dealing with massive health issues. And, um, you know, as we look at the changes in government subsidies, as we look at what the role of farmers will be, um, you know, especially the subsidies for agriculture, where are we putting in the health concerns? How are, how are you looking at that? I think that is one of the, the massive opportunities now. Um, when we talk about growth and, and targets for growth, the horticult horticultural sector 
is the one sector that has enormous possibilities for growing. You know, um, if we take strawberries as an example, it's been a massive success story. Nobody knows that it's been a success story, but we are now totally self-sufficient in strawberries from April through to the end of October. Um, so we can grow much more of our fruit and veg at home, and we should be. Um, but I think the focus on a healthy, balanced diet, you know, we have one of the most sustainable um, sugar beet production systems in the entire world. Nobody knows about it. Um, and, and they need to, ultimately. So we need to have a much bigger, broader conversation around a healthy, balanced diet and our climatic conditions because, you know, we have the climate to be growing. You look at what is happening, and this is about looking out and seeing what is happening. Argentina is in the midst of a very, very severe drought at the moment. And we, I know we moan about it a lot of the time, but in most parts of the country, you know, we have, um, you know a good climatic condition and we have a lot of rain, um, which is something to, to really treasure. So we should be able to you know, in, invest in that. I think water is Emma Howard Boyd sitting in front of me looking slightly quizzical at me as I'm saying, but you know, water is, is the opportunity. But again, I, I don't think we've, we've really focused on the opportunities there um, that we have that linked to horticulture, linked to growing that sector. Um, there's, there's enormous opportunity and the nutritional value that you rightly refer to, fresh fruit and veg, um, you know, that's surely a big opportunity, isn't it, I think? Just on that last point and to wrap up, uh, I would remind you that until last year, Northumberland held the world record wheat yield uh, until a New Zealander um, came along and beat Rod Smith off, off his perch. And that's because we have a combination of day length in June and soil moisture that they would kill for in Kansas, where they also grow wheat. So let's not, you know, do ourselves down. We do have some advantages. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had a fascinating conversation, uh, a, a superb presentation, and a real reminder of the importance of the people who make the landscape work. So please thank Minette Batters for her contribution. Thank you.